Secrets of ornamentation. Well, I'm going to say my opinion on ornamentation <laughs> and uh, my opinion of how it has worked for me. And certainly, I think it's worked for a lot of other people. So uh, I think there are three main things we should talk about. One is simply how to do it, the techniques, at least. And we're talking mostly about cross string ornamentation. That's the the main reason for this talk. Um, after, I'd like to talk about why we should do it, um, and then also where we should do it, in which pieces and in which situations. Where should we use cross-string trills or mordants, ornaments, etc. When I was a student, I heard some recordings of Ida Presti and La Goya, and they were the first people that I heard playing the trills on two strings. They're fantastic. Uh, you can hear it, it. There's an old recording of them playing uh, Pasacaglia by Handel, and Ida Presti does the trill. It's superb, totally amazing. And I was blown away by that. And I thought, wow, I've got to learn to do this. And so at first, when I started doing it, um, most of the critics and things didn't seem to like it very much in Britain. One of them uh, said that, uh, or wrote, that uh, my trill sounded like an old-fashioned doorbell, which was not very uh, complimentary, but <laughs> so um, anyway, I liked it, so I kept on going. Um, you know, if you think of the players that I was listening to at that time, well, it's Segovia, of course, John Williams and Julian Bream, mainly them, no, they didn't use these trills, not because they, could, not because they couldn't, but uh, simply it was not really something that people liked. But certainly once I got it working, it made a big difference to a lot of my repertoire because I think it made some of my Baroque music sound maybe different from some other people. And uh, certainly it was a lot of fun in the Scarlatti pieces and Bach cadences, etc. Um, to include it. So at first, I tried to use basically what I assumed that Ida Presti was doing, and that is the technique where it's basically it's like a tremolo. I'm just going to tip this so you can see my right hand. So it would be A I M P. So just as if you were doing, but with the M passing on to the second string. It's fairly easy to do that get it going quite fast without any problem. The only thing is that I've always played with quite a lot of side angle to, to get the sound that I want. When you do that, the M finger really catches if you're sideways and if it, the I finger has to stretch out too much. If you're the kind of player that plays like that, perhaps it would work fine, but it doesn't work for me. So I changed to using A, I, M, P. Partly just because the, the I and the P sit very easily on the second string and the AM sit on the first string. That started to work very well for me. I also found that I didn't need to actually move the arm to pluck the thumb. So, so that's really what I was aiming at. A process where um, you can basically get rid of all the irregularities that we may have when we do this. Now, normally when you do that, um, the thumb is going to be too loud, right? So we really have to learn to pluck the thumb to sound just the same as the fingers. That's one of, it's quite an important thing. So usually the thumb is used on the bass strings. And so we're not so careful about the actual tone quality because it doesn't really suffer, you know. You play it any old way and it works. Once it goes into the second string, it really has to be more carefully filed and things. So we do that. Um, I found that to, to develop the speed and the flexibility in the trill, I first of all started the thing of playing these two together and these two together. When I was doing that, that eventually that goes pretty fast. And then you just separate them. Just 
keep that going. That would be a trill starting on the lower node. Usually, usually start on the upper note because although not always, but in the Baroque music, I think it's uh, better to be able to start on the upper note. Um, after I got the, <laughs> the trills working, uh, I think it's important to have maybe a, a set of um, basic ornaments. That is lower, lower mordant and upper mordant. So, so I have a pattern for that. So use the three fingers, A, I, M. It's so easy to play that fast and smooth. I think so if you have a little ornament, well, I'm in a D string, but um, you know, just a, it's really easy to put in a little, um, a little simple ornament that is just going to adorn your piece a little bit. The lower one, uh, the upper one, uh, you might not use it so much, but it's a strange thing that if you are playing Baroque music and you do this kind of ornament and you do that, sometimes it doesn't really sound very Baroque, whereas it sounds okay because of that kind of crispness that the uh, two string trill gives to your, to your music or to your sound, if you like. So this one, so that's, that's no, no right hand, just left hand. That one sounds a little bit like Giuliani or Villa Lobos even, whereas this one can sound much more like Scarlatti if you like. So if you want to do an upper mordant, pretty much that is going to work better. Singers were still kind of in the, in the technique thing. Um, a lot of this is going to work better if you use a bright sound. If you, if you have a dark, um, you know, fat sound, I'm not sure here on the computer if you're going to um, be aware of it, but if your sound is, and you do an ornament like that, it, it's too fluffy. It's much better to have a bright, which will be, means playing a little bit more straight across the string, not so much angle. But it depends, that's getting into um, the aesthetics and the taste that one may have for it. But usually when I'm doing the Baroque music, I'm playing with a lot of ornaments. I usually play with a brighter sound generally, which would be straighter and pulling upwards more than sideways and pushing through. So let's see. So if you have... Um, prefer to not, when, when you want a brighter sound, some people go towards the bridge. And you, certainly when you play down towards the bridge, you get more resistance from the string, which at times that feels good, but it often sounds um, too harsh. So I prefer to do it just by turning sideways. So the string still has a kind of softness to it that is, that, that's too aggressive sounding. That's be a better word. So if I did the handle again and I played it here, I really don't like it. So I play it bright, but bright here. On our, on our instrument, we don't really have to copy other instruments. We, um, we can do our own thing, if you like. But I remember when I was a young player, well, even the, even the pretty good players. I'm going to exclude someone like John Williams or something that is totally exceptional technically, but many of the players, when the trill came, it was kind of scratchy in comparison to the rest of the playing, even really good players. And, and also my own trills, were, you know, so you'd have a piece going and you have, uh, and they would be, and then there's the trill. It was just so weak in comparison to the rest of the piece. Uh, we all have heard the big, Bach fugue, or whatever, and there's that trill with B major thing, it's just that. And whereas suddenly, it just sounds much more alive and bright. And if you think, um, 
let's say, because we're talking about Bach in this case, um, Bach played several instruments, or whatever, but a lot of his pieces were written playing on the keyboard. And when he plays the trill, it's actually louder than the single notes. The moment the, the double notes or the, the trill comes, whereas on the guitar and on the lute, etc., the trill is often actually quieter than the other notes. All the plat notes are defined, and then the trill or the ornament is actually weaker. And so if you want that for the musical reasons or whatever, then that's fine. But uh, if you want to uh, keep the power that the ornament can give, well, I would say the two-string trill will definitely help it. That's one of the reasons. There's another reason would be that in our concert, we have some romantic pieces and some contemporary pieces and whatever, and some Baroque music, and maybe some earlier music, whatever. So if you are playing only the trills in your Baroque music, it's one more way of making that section of your concert sound different and not basically sound like yet some more Giuliani or not because I don't like Giuliani, I love it, but uh, we want them to sound distinguish one from the other. So using ornaments is one of the ways uh, that your Baroque music can distinguish itself. Um, there's another reason why I think it's uh, it's pretty good to, to use these if, if, you, if you can do them well. And this is one of my reasons. Um, I'm not sure if uh, the players nowadays will, will want this or whatever, but um, we as, as concert players, we also have to distinguish ourselves from other players. So uh, if you find something, maybe some repertoire or a, a transcriptions, etc., whatever, that no one else plays and you also are playing it in a way that no one else can do. Maybe they can, but are, they're not doing it. Well, that's one way of making your playing um, outstanding in its own way from the other players. Now, you know, nowadays there are lots and lots of really good players. So all of you young players have to find ways of being unique. And uh, ornamentation is, is one of the ways. Now, if we use ornamentation, we follow the rules exactly, then we're all gonna sound the same. <laughs> So we do have to break out from the rules a little bit. And uh, in many ways, the rules follow the players rather than the players follow the rules. Um, but to break the rules, you should know the rules. <laughs> so at, after we'll talk just a little bit about some of the uh, literature that is written both in the Baroque period and also by studious people. <laughs> um, so that we can understand, at least as far as possible, we can understand um, what they were doing. Now, I, I still have sometimes my doubts as to, um, you know, when something is written down, can you imagine if somebody was writing down how Segovia played, will we really know how he played? Well, probably not, but we could have some idea of, of what he was transmitting, at least to that critic. So it's pretty good to be able to read what people were writing about the players and what some of the composers were writing as to how their ornamentation should be implemented, right? And some people say, well, Bach said, oh, don't do so much ornamentation. Well, maybe someone was uh, tearing the arse out of it. So they were overdoing it. So he ended up as a person that says, don't do any ornamentation. Yet he ornaments enormously. Um, in some of his pieces. And there, there are some pieces that he wrote down first without ornamentation, and then it was in a manuscript full of ornamentation. So it was definitely used. Um, just, uh, we're still talking about the why, why we're doing it. Now, but when, we're, when we're doing it, if it sounds worse, don't do it. <laughs> you know, if it's making your piece worse, just forget it. It's not worth it. You know, uh, it's, it's a, uh, I would say it's an added luxury um, to ornament 
a lot, you know, and some players do it fantastically well. And, and sometimes you end up maybe enjoying more of their not ornamentation than the piece itself. Um, so we have to be careful, if you like. Um, when you're starting to ornament, it would be really good to get a fairly simple Baroque piece that is completely unknown. <laughs> so nobody knows what the original was. And so nobody has um, preconceived ideas about what should be done in this piece, you know. So if you start ornamenting the Bach Chacon, just everybody thinks they know how it should be. And probably everybody is right in their own mind anyway. So if you ornament it, you're, you're gonna fight with their own uh, preconceived ideas. Um, so that's why when, when I did a lot of ornamentation and some, well, the handle I just played and things like that, certainly all the keyboard players know that piece. The guitarists don't know it, <laughs> didn't know it at all. And so, of course, I think the, the last movement was known, but the first movement wasn't. So I could really do a lot of ornamentation on it and, or at least do what, as much as I think Handel wanted. Um, and didn't have to fight with uh, with their uh, with the audience's preconceived thoughts about it. Uh, the last year, I'm not sure if I played it in Tucson, but I've been playing a suite by a guy called Jacques Saint Luc, and even historically, it's difficult to find out who he is because there are two of them. They're both from Belgium. They're probably related, and the suite is absolutely beautiful and it's relatively simple, so you can really go to town and do quite a lot to it. I just find a bit of it here. It's a, it's a really neat, uh, neat piece. But uh, there's a little practice. So. Um, <laughs> I decided to stick on that side, partly because of what the piece really is trying to say. But um, the idea is, before you head into ornamenting the well-known pieces, <laughs> do some unknown pieces. <laughs> and also, if they don't sound very good, it really doesn't matter. You can chuck them out. It doesn't have to be part of your repertoire anymore. You know, whereas if if you do it on a very famous piece, it's maybe something that you do want to keep for many years in your life. The, I think we should distinguish between the ornaments that the composer has asked for in this piece. For example, in the handle, there are a lot of markings. And so we as guitarists have to do our best to, if we're going to play that piece, um, we have to do our best to implement his uh, ornamental signs, right? Now, we're not gonna do what the keyboard can do because it's simply not possible. You know, it's, uh, they have, it's just so much easier for them to do so many more things. So we really have to choose uh, ornaments that are gonna work for us. And uh, so that's one kind of ornament. The other kind of ornament is the added stuff. You know, we just stick in a trill here or there or little passing notes or, especially little mordants. Um, now, you, they can add color to the piece. Now, if you study the music by Couperin, for example, and, and other um, composers similar to him, uh, often his music is really full of little markings. And right enough, if you take out all the ornaments from Couperin, it sounds pretty bare, uh, if not naked. So it, it really needs those little frills now, if you try and do all that the keyboard player is doing, it's not really going to work. So we sometimes have to maybe choose some or even choose different ones. So I've been playing a lot of Cooper in the last few years. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, and especially because I've really had to think about how I can put in the right ornaments. There are also another distinguishing thing between ornaments. You have Ornaments in cadence ornaments, that is the ornaments that are, um, say, well, like B to E or whatever, those are really necessary. Right? They, they, I wouldn't even call them an ornament. That's a cadential trill is really a part, integral part of the, of the piece. But 
a little twiddle here or there. It, it, that's up to you, right? So that's, if you like, the added uh, luxury or whatever you've decided to add to your piece. Um, I think also we should think about, again, two, but there are probably more distinguishing things. If the music come, if you're doing a transcription and it comes from the keyboard, now, even if it says lute on it, but uh, say Bach did it on the keyboard first or whatever, um, the kind of ornaments may be different um, than a piece that is definitely a lute um, from the lute repertoire. Uh, so perhaps if you're playing Weiss or Katzberger or whatever, um, it may be that the cross the string cross string trills uh, might actually hurt the piece or change its character. Now, here we have a kind of dilemma that maybe each of us can resolve our own way. I mean, uh, um, I've played some handle where sorry, some vice where I've decided I'm going to use the, the trills, the cross the string trills, because um, I feel what, once it's a transcription, it's a transcription. I don't have the same tuning as the lute, so I don't have the freedom for the fr empty, uh, sorry, um, open strings, etc. And uh, I don't have a lute sound. Uh, the Baroque lute, is, it's quite a different instrument, even though the actual techniques are not vastly different from ours. But the sound production and everything is really very different to ours. So. I did that once or twice with, with some suites by Vice and some others. But uh, generally, I wouldn't do that. Generally, I would prefer to um, keep it lute like, not because I want to copy the, the lute itself, but I would like to be closer to where the composer may have had in his, what he would have had in his mind when he was writing the piece. Perhaps. I mean, it's always a supposition from the part of the player. Um, I would say our, our instrument is closer, has a closer relationship uh, in terms of sound to the keyboard, well, to the, to the harpsichord, if you like, than it does to bowed instruments or to blown instruments. All the, those instruments have, have the possibility to um, continue the power of the note through the note. We have a note that starts and dies from there forward, um, just like the keyboard. So I think our kind of ornamentation and our kind of, our use of it and things is going to be more related to them than to what the violin can do or the cello, whatever. So I feel that when I'm playing music that may be originally written for the cello, for example, um, I'm no longer playing it on the cello. So if I want to copy the cello, I'm just going to be a weak version. I prefer to do everything that really sounds best for the guitar. Now, I think that those kind of trills sound great. So I use them quite a lot. Um, other people may don't, doesn't matter. You know, we each, we each choose. There was another thing I've just marked down in some notes there. Some people worry about the situation of mixing them in the same piece. You know, can you can you do some on two strings, some on single strings? And things? Well, yeah, I mean, sometimes you have to because you simply are not able to put a two string trill in or you're not able to put a left hand trill. So use the right hand. And sometimes it's almost whimsical. That is, you just say, well, the hell, I like this, so I'll do it. And then next time you learn the piece, you do something. Um, one, one of the examples is the lure, or, or lure of the uh, fourth lute suite, which um, I don't know if I've got it in here, but when, when I did that, um, the first time I did it, let's see where it is. You know, I tried to do, uh, uh, yeah. and I did the whole worked it out and things, but. In the end, it turned the piece into this kind of overly bright, slightly aggressive, um, tight sort of piece, and very different to what I really liked in the piece. So uh, although the rest of that suite, I would probably use much more two-string trills, uh, 
in, in this movement. Uh, I prefer um, left hand trills, you know, or left hand ornament most of the time, right? Now, there's another little thing that um, this is perhaps harking back to some of the um, uh, some, some of the problem of the technique itself. Sometimes when you do a small ornament, like just a little um, lower mordant or something like that, you have to be really careful. Should it be a sharp or a not a sharp? <laughs> At times you can use both or either and things, but it will affect your, um, the, the sound, if you like, and it'll affect the, the key, the harmony, if you like. Um, you know, the, uh, the famous... Uh... So when you do that, um, if we stick in a little ornament on the first one, it sounds quite different. Both are actually acceptable in this case. Uh, or... But you have to really choose. Now use your ear, use your knowledge of harmony, counterpoint, whatever you have. And also listen to, listen to the people that maybe have more experience, although most of the faces I'm seeing are very experienced people. But still, uh, listen to what other people are doing and make your choices. But certainly I've, I've changed my idea or my mind over some of these. And I remember having an argument with someone actually about that one there. Um, because this other person hated what I did and I hated what they did. And in the end, well, you know, we were both probably right and we we're both wrong. You know, um, so, some ornaments you cannot change. You can't do that. But, you know, in E minor, both actually, they have a pretty neat sound to it. So once we move into the, the well, once we've got the basic trills done, um, we should talk about what extra you're going to do. So this is going back to the how, the technique itself, right? Um, after you have the um, sim simple one, then slightly extended, extended. There, what I did was I just added, I used AIMP and I added on AI again. So, the reason I, I learned that one because um, sometimes the, the four notes um, is just a little bit short. It's not really generous enough. And so, in some pieces, a slightly longer trill is better. Slightly longer. If you go the full two rounds, uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, it's too much, right? You find in, in some Scarlatti, the famous um, that one there. Um, it's got some really nice little runs. It's somewhere up here. Uh, Scarlatti, Scarlatti, this one here. Um, and I'll see if I can play this. Uh, and it does that many, many times. You've got that little motif there, a run finishing the little trill. And it, yeah, you could finish it with just four notes, um, like just like, it's just a little bit short, you know, and it, it, it almost makes you want to play the piece faster. Whereas if you can add on that extra, those extra two notes. So we've got the, the four note trill, the six note trill, and then this eight note trill, right? And so on, right? Now, I would say um, when you learn the piece, um, decide clearly how many you're going to do. Because when you get to your concert, you're full of adrenaline, your fingers work much faster, and then you brrr, and you stick way too many notes in, <laughs> and it just doesn't sound good. Um, so it's better to actually play fewer notes, but really well, <laughs> than just do a really fast trill that's just a mess, right? And in fact, if you listen carefully to to many of the keyboard players, the, the harpsichord players, their trills are not so fast. You know, on the keyboard, because they, they are completely even, you know, they, they, the two notes sound just exactly the same volume. Uh, there's a strength in it that we often don't get. 
because we usually have one is louder, the less, the other is less, one is brighter, the other, and so on. So really, if you listen to them, I, I recorded a couple, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear them here, but um, let's see these memo notes. So, uh, Princess. So, okay, okay. So it's not so fast, right? There's a there's a beautiful piece by Bach that goes. Let's see, it's one of these Symphonia, and it goes like this. Um, And Bach wrote that first without any ornamentation, <laughs> and then he ornamented it. So we should study it to see what his ideas were. Where, where can you put in a little run, um, for example? So there we get from our little simple ornament, we add in the run to it. So. so from that, you'll discover that you take your simple ornament, then you have to have exits and entrances to it. That is, how to get out of the ornament, not just play the ornament and then next note. Well, at times, yes, but at times, there may be a turn on the end, or upward, down, downward, and the entrance is not always just... Um, sorry. But it's, so with the run... It just adds a whole lot extra to it, right? And you'll find many, many cases where uh, we guitarists tend to play the ornament, stop, then do the exit. We've got to integrate them. <laughs> and they really sound better when they belong to each other, right? Um, there are lots, and this piece is a really neat piece to study. Uh, it's the Symphonia, or three-part um, invention number five. BWV 791. There we go. Um, it's a neat piece to study and it's a fantastic piece to play. I mean, it's really, I played it sometimes in concerts and uh, it's just so beautiful. I, I've got several harpsichordists playing it, you know, and because it's a very slow piece, their ornaments are relatively slow. I mean, really slower than we do it, you know, and they sound great. So sometimes I like to practice to see if I can really get. Um, I want not today. Uh, fingers are not working, but when you do that, as close in in quality of sound between the two notes, but on the guitar, of course, second string, third string. There's always going to be some differences, you know. But we can live with them as long as the the power and the attack is very similar. Uh, I think that's important. Um, let's see, I have a few more examples that I want to talk about. Um, let's see, in the Cooperan, where's my Cooperan, 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 here we go. You know, a lot of this music sounds really neat when you, when you put a capo on because it just brightens it up so much more than, here we go. I've played this piece a lot then. So, goes. So, I'll just make sure you can see my right hand. And so on. And the whole piece is just full of these little takes out. If you notice, I'm really. I'm working hard not to get the trills too fast, right? So that you have the, uh, the nice... Uh... So you really feel all the notes, you know? The temptation for many of us is to do this kind of speeding up towards the end. And, and so you trill kind of sound at the end. 
I would really try and avoid that, right? A trill can, can have a bit of an acceleration towards the end, if you like, but controlled. It really sounds so much better and so much more powerful and crisp if you don't do that. Um, there's another, another one of Cooperans that very famous. Um, the little like barricades, you know, they... Here I've got an, an upper more than. Because it really it has no time to actually stick it in starting playing four notes. Three notes is more than enough. It's just a little passing ornament, right? And then the ornaments that come at the end are, are going to be the longer ones. Another thing that Tom reminded me of earlier. Um, when we, play, when we play our ornaments, this is going back to the technique again, um, but connected to where we're going to use it. Um, normally, uh, when a keyboard player plays an ornament, not always, but many times, what happens is that the ornament comes before the beat, right? It goes da -di -rum, and on the beat is the bass note. Whereas most of the time on the guitar, we put the bass note on the first note of the ornament, right? So we have to go like this. And we have the bass note, well, I'll put an A or a C. So that, right? But sometimes it's better to do that. So, and get the, get the ornament and actually play it before the beat. It really sounds nice when you can do it well. Uh, to do that, obviously, if you've got too many notes, it's not going to work. But most of the time, um, if this is not too fast, um, so I practice that a lot to make sure that my thumb comes in here, right? right? And it's more difficult when you have four notes, right? So there we're kind of fudging it because I'm going bass and the beat actually comes on the last note, but the, uh, the bass note has come early. When it's a cadential one, you can use the thing of one, two, three, four, five, six. And on the sixth note, if it's the index, your your thumb is going to be free, right? Um, so, so, that's the way I do it. I know, Misa, you use a, a different pattern which frees up at, at a different moment. Um, so, Misael will teach you all how to use his pattern. <laughs> yeah, wait. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they, I can see you, because that's why I just remembered, because we talked, we talked about it before, and his pattern, he can get the thumb free at a different point in, in the pattern, right? Um, it's, it's, it would be good to be able to use them both, really, because sometimes you're going to need the, uh, the thumb sooner. Most of the time, you, you know, we, our, our our music, our playing, if you like, is not so perfect. So at times, if something is slightly off and that bass note is just in front or whatever, I can live with it. You know? um, I can't live with it if it's, if it's like this. <laughs> right? And then it has to be, you know, so if you finish your trill on the thumb and then you've got to jump down, uh, you're going to lose the rhythm. And if it's an important cadential moment, it's not going to be so good. Now, some of the tricks I used before, let's see if I can remember some. I'll go to the handle. What, what I used is this, okay. Okay, I don't know if you can see, you've got to see both hands for this trick, right? Um, boom, there's an ace. <laughs> no, so it's the trill. I'm going to finish it that, and then I just played the bottom note there with the left hand. Right? If it's, a, if it's a bottom note, it's pretty easy to do. If it's a covered note, uh, if you needed that note, uh, let's see, okay. If you, 
you may at some point need that. It's not so easy if you're having to use two fingers to pluck the note, one holding and one plucking, you know. But if it's an open string, it's really quite easy to do, just to, to learn to play it with the left hand. So with which note do we have? Right, works out pretty easily, right? I used that three or four times in this, in, in this transcription. After some years, I learned to do it and I just use the uh, and just use that one where I finish. I didn't used to know how to do that. <laughs> um, but I must say when I, if in this occasion, on this bar, uh, it makes the trill quite short. Right? Because that note comes really soon. Whereas the other one, the old one, sorry. Trill is just a little bit more generous, and we can almost extend that moment. You learn to do both and then choose. Sort of trills, it becomes difficult to make sure that you're maintaining the same rhythm that's been marked. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the way you think about the rhythms and you know any diminuendo or or slowing down or anything and making sure that everything stays within those boundaries that the composer gives you or yeah. extend out a little bit extra just to make it more dramatic or something like that. Well, what, what I would say is that uh, many times when, when we hear um, our ornamentation and trills, many of us end up fudging the rhythm. <laughs> you know, let, that is, we take more time about it than than really should be. When it's a cadential trill, perhaps it's a moment where there's a little bit more flexibility. And I, I would say more, uh, more than just uh, what the composer has laid out, is you have to think of what the audience is feeling in terms of the rhythm. Now, if, if you suddenly stop on just on that, on that trill, it's really hurt the flow. You know, the, uh, let's see, the famous, um, the famous uh, few. There's several places where, where there's, there are trills and anything. Da -da 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 -dum, bum, bum, bum. And I can't remember, but now those trills, those small cadences, I feel very uncomfortable when people lose the rhythm there, right? And so whatever you are adding in, say whatever extra notes, make sure that you can do it in time so that you choose if you, if you later decide, no, I want to slow down on this. I want to make a big deal of this moment. Okay, that's fine. But uh, you have to make sure that, that your technique is able to keep that rhythm going, right? You know, if not your technique is choose or your lack of it at this moment uh, is choosing the rhythm. <laughs> Right. So I think it's, I would prefer to have um, a smaller trill rather than a, a, bad, a bad rhythm trill, right? Unless you are convincing enough with your change of rhythm. Yeah, uh, you know, da -da 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 -da. say at the end of, you know, uh, of that thing. Da -da. In that case, uh, you've, actually, you've actually relinquished rhythm. So, uh, so people are not expecting, <laughs> you, you know, those kind of cadences, you can go to town. I mean, that's, uh, that's fairly simple. You could do more ornamentation in the eg exit or in the entry to the trill and it would be fine. So if, if the ornament is in a, a moment when uh, the pulse of the piece is not so important, Go to town <laughs> and do you know enjoy it. But if the pulse is a really integral part of the piece at that moment, the ornament really has to not hurt it. So I don't know if that's a complete answer for you, but I think that that's the way I feel. And I must say, what many times, I mean, you've seen my lessons. Many times we end up working on the ornaments because the person, the player, has lost their rhythm <laughs> in that moment. Right. Okay. David, uh, just to follow up on Lucas's question, 
So when you put the passing seventh there, are you playing that the index finger and the A at the same time? Is that the trick you're using to get there? Yeah, this 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 case here, you know, in the um, in the lute version, uh, there are many more notes. But sometimes, what is better to have all the notes and have a bad trill, or uh, have a good trill and enough to suggest that it's a B7? <laughs> you know. So in this case here, the way I've played it is. Uh, And I just come down. So on this one, I finish the trill and then play the seventh. Or uh, yeah, and just I just want that passing note, the the, the seventh into the a, a to G sharp, because it's there, and I think it really is an integral part. Although obviously the violin maybe didn't have it, but. Uh, so in this case, I'm not. I'm not going to go. Dear, uh, how would it be? Uh, you're not sure. I w I'm too disappointed with that trill or here. So, uh, so I prefer. I prefer the, the power. For your right hand, you end up with on the D sharp with the thumb, and then you hit the the other bass after. Um, yes, on the F, but I just get down as quick as. So I don't know if you can see my. Um... Oh yeah, it's an F sharp. I'm sorry. It's all... Yes, yeah. Because and, I want. And, and what what finger are you playing the A with? A I M P A I M P. And then the and then the passing seventh note. What do you play with? What finger are you using? Um. Sorry, I'm just jumping down. It, it's um, as I say, our our piece in this moment has relinquished rhythm, so there's a kind of chaos that happens while you're playing this this dominant chord. It, it's it's not structurally rhythmic, right? And the feeling of Chaos finishing when you go. So I don't mind it being completely out of rhythm and even out of place a bit, and then in time, it's the the resolution is chaos to things in its place. You you said something about the rhythm. Can you say something about the tonality that interacts in the, in putting the trills in? In, 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 for example, leading tones especially or yeah. things like that. Okay, well, uh, all these pages. Um, no, um, if you if you do this, it, it can't be because the moment you do that, uh, you you're modulating into another key or it, that. So if you are in sitting in E and you want to ornament the note, ornament in the key. But if you're in E minor. Uh, the D natural, but in E uh, minor, you could also use the D, D sharp. Uh, uh. So in a minor key, often there are moments when you have to really choose carefully, right? That, that was all I meant about the tonality, right? And it's much more important if, let's say, um, if you're going to go, right, you obviously can't go you can't use that note, uh, right? So if you're going to do a long run into it, it would have to be those notes. You can't do that. <laughs> your ears will tell you, but your ears and your knowledge of, of harmony should tell you that, <laughs> okay? Because if you went, you're saying, you know, you're obviously taking it into a different key. So whatever key you're in, make sure that whatever ornaments you do, that they fit in well. Hey, David, um, I have a question. You, you talked about before um, some interesting things about, you know, whether to do 
trills like that on Giuliani or or even perhaps other Baroque composers like Weiss and and and, and so forth. Uh, what's your take on on Renaissance ornamentation? Do you use uh, any any cross string trills there at all? And I, I think there's a question that Tom also had brought up uh, at some point. And yeah, I'm just wondering what your general sort of approach is to ornamenting a piece in the Renaissance period. Yeah. Well, you know, a, a lot of Renaissance is also keyboard music. <laughs> so, you know, if you're if you're playing uh, say William Byrd or something, you know, it's all keyboard music. Some of it was transcribed to the lute and uh, and played by lutenists. But um, so it would maybe it depends whose name is there as a composer. You know, if it's Dowland, then I wouldn't do it. You know, I would uh, either play the those um, the, the the plat note ones like the lute players do, either use that or or play the the. the the, the kind of just the little ornaments that the little twiddles or the little you know little little things like that that obviously they did um i think it's uh, if you're transcribing renaissance music but it comes from um another instrument i've got some some stuff here that you know i was going to say because a lot of these I, I, you know now you can get all of this stuff on internet and things this is a guy called um Robert Jones, right? But he's from the same time as Purcell and you know these English guys. It's, it's beautiful music. I mean, I think, and uh, he gives a whole series of stuff as to what what his ornamentation signs mean. S since then, many things have become standardised. But of course, this is keyboard music, and so if you're going to play it. Uh, you don't need to play it like a lutenist would be playing it because you're doing it on this instrument, not the lute. So when you say Renaissance music, I, I obviously, I assume what you mean is Dowland type of music. And, you know, <laughs> Dowland, uh, it's a bit like Bach that he's haloed. If you played some Robert Jones, nobody's ever heard of him, so you do what you want. <laughs> You could even give it a different date if you, you, you know. I mean, you're not going to do that, of course. But um, it's uh, you are freer with music that is not known, right? So you are freer to maybe use um, two strings, especially small ornaments that are just little passing notes. I don't know if you can hear me, but li little passing notes that um, on two string, I think, sound fine in all styles. You know, if if they're played tastefully, if you like. But don't do it in Dowland, because Dowland and some of the other well-known, especially the, the English, Da Milano, th these guys, it's not, it's not gonna help the, help the music. It's not gonna make it any better. Thank but you. He, look, just, just seeing as this is actually going in the different direction, but you all know this piece. Uh, So we get that. And then. So if you do it well, I don't know the piece, but, but um, I used to play it. But I used to often play this with the, with the, the ornament on two strings. Uh, sounds beautiful if it is well. I mean, and that is actually closer to what Albeniz would have heard when he was playing it on the piano than, um, than that, right? So it depends on, on the, your ability to make it smooth or not. And this one I, I did for fun. I mean, just uh, it sounds perfectly good on the left hand to have a trill that, that, that goes, sorry, that would be. perfectly good, you know, but at times, eh, why not try something else? So that's why I changed to the, uh, that one, that one, and so on. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's uh, great. Uh, uh, before I forget, I, if it's okay, I'll ask a follow-up question. Um, the, I, I know a lot of times you talk about a crescendo sort of built into the 
into the trill, uh, or actually decrescendo in most cases, especially when considering that the last note that usually falls on the thumb uh, shouldn't have an accent. Is there a way that you sort of approach that when you practice? I mean, of course, purposefully either doing a decrescendo, but is there some way that you sort of program it into your hand when you learn a piece? I think it's, you know, in, in, in the classes, say, in the lessons and things, um, so many people end up kind of thumping the last note. And often, you know, it's not that I, I want the last note necessarily um, quieter. It's just that it, it shouldn't necessarily have a thump. You know, sometimes yes and sometimes no. And there are moments when a note of a trill should have more power. And there are moments when it actually is better if it goes in the opposite direction. So to I was, thinking, of, I was thinking about that one when, when you talked about how sometimes in the keyboard, for example, the trill actually sounds more powerful than, than the section before, which, which it should, of course, is the credential stuff. So sometimes I, you know, it's, it's interesting uh, to address each, I guess, each uh, moment in specific in, in a piece, because sometimes, like you said, sometimes it feels better to kind of go for the trill and, and just do a crescendo on the trill. But then if yeah. you kind of whack the last note, it kind of takes it away. So it's it's sort of a little bit weird for guitar, I think. And I'm, I'm just wondering how you generally think of that. You know, a big cadential trill at the end of a large section, you usually kind of want to go for more volume. But at the same time, you have to be careful, of course, of not overdoing it and not whacking the last note like you were talking about. Well, I, I would use my ear and hopefully um, choose one or the other, right? Um, Sometimes, perhaps in the, in the classes, I've asked people to be careful with the last note or learn to play it gentler, but sometimes people's thumb has a, a fatter sound than the fingers. And so it goes dilly boom. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the change in sound itself often makes the last note the least beautiful <laughs> of the trill. And yet it should be the most beautiful in some ways. It should be the note, well, what, it's one of the notes that we should enjoy when you go so that last note is the one that you're going to actually live with whereas if you play that last note ugly in an ugly way uh, it's a pity <laughs> and they, I, I found a place in actually it was in that lovely little piece by Bach fingering uh, let's see if I can find it because sometimes Sometimes trills, when you have, um, uh, there's that one, and then it was, uh, so sometimes it's, it's good to have a loud note, whether it's on, from the left hand trill or the right hand trill. Um, I was a little bit ugly, but so I'm trying to, I'm trying to actually have a, have a beat on the last, on the end of the trill. Right? But, uh, so if the piece is going to do that, it's actually better to smooth out. Um, and so the last D, you have to be much more gentle. If it was, sorry, then strong D. Um, gentler D. So you need to control the power. You understand what I mean? It's a, it, so each situation is going to dictate whether it's strong or not. But Misa, one of the things you can, uh, we can use is when you want to make a crescendo in your trill, often instead of thinking of the crescendo, you just do a little bit of an accelerando and you actually get a crescendo because the notes are piling up on each other. A bit like when we talked about tremolo often, you know, if you, if you speed up and slow down your tremolo, that will give a sense of volume growing or diminishing, right? And here as well, as you speed up, it actually sounds more powerful. Whether it's really louder or not, it's not so important. It's the feeling that it's giving that I think is important. Okay, let, let me continue because Edwin's written here a, a question, a long question. Okay, he's, he's talking about the whole thing about the original key. Hi there. Hi, Edwin. How are you? Um, yeah, about if you make a transcription in the original key or not. And also, 
you know, if we use Cordatura Capo, uh, also the problem with uh, whether we use the old tuning, well, that is lower an A. Is that what you meant? A440 or A or, yes, lower down. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't have a, um, a perfect pitch. That is, so, so if something is half a tone out, as long as it's in tune with itself, I'm happy, right? And also, because I grew up listening to pieces um, in different keys from what, where the original was, it doesn't really bother me, right? And in fact, um, if, if it is too uncomfortable on the guitar, the, what you gain by saying, this is the original key, you lose by the quality of the performance, if, if, unless, you, unless you can perform it really well. But if it's too uncomfortable, it hurts our performance. So um, choosing a key can often be very, very important for, uh, for our instrument because of the nature of our instrument. I mean, it's, a, it, it's not an easy instrument and we want to use the open strings to get, let us get around. Some keys on the guitar sing better than others. You know, they just, the guitar just comes alive and then if you put it a tone lower, bump, it's dead or so on. But, Usually when I transcribe pieces, I really try different keys to find out if it's going to work better in, a, in another key. And you, you say there about the, the scoratura, yeah, at times, of course, you want detuning especially, you know, but sometimes could use some other tunings. It would be interesting, especially, you know, if you're playing a piece and it actually sounds or works best in F and you're not going to need the bottom note, why not tune up to F? I mean, Fernando Sor did it and others have done it, you know. And then there's the other question of the, the uh, F-sharp tuning in the middle, which often actually makes us, uh, it, it facilitates a lot of other, uh, other things because the, the third is moved to a different place, you know, on our strings. Um, so at times, Though I haven't used it much, but at times uh, I think it's a very good idea. You know, just, just talking about that, obviously um, when Misa asked me about the, the Dowland and things, I would almost always, not always, but almost always, if I was playing anything written originally for the lute, use the F-sharp tuning, if it's the, um, you know, the, the Renaissance lute. And then when it's written for the Baroque lute, there is a big problem with this tuning thing because for them often it was really quite easy to play. Well, that is the, the fingering, whatever. And for us, it's just maniacally difficult. And there was a guy in Belgium a long time ago, I mean, this is 50 years ago. So he published, his name is something Pyenbroek. And he published a lot of pieces, some by Weiss, but also by lesser known, um, Baroque players, where he had F sharp and a D. And it was really... So, so he had that on the top, right? And then a D tuning the bottom. And it, some of the pieces were actually noticeably easier. And also he chose a key that would work with this tuning. And uh, not only easier, but actually the, the, the instrument sings in a different way. <laughs> And so it was really nice. I learned some pieces of his transcriptions a long time ago, and yeah, they were nice. I mean, then just to continue with your questions, get back into tune. Uh, you you asked about the capo. Yeah, I think for example, you you play off often as a duo, and at times the piece a struggle in F sharp or in G or something, but it would be really easy in E. Just use the capo. <laughs> you know, sometimes you say, oh, but I'm losing one bass note. Well, come on, you lose one bass note and ga gain 200 good higher notes. <laughs> you know, it's worth it. Then also, I, I often use the capo because it changes the sound of our guitar. You know, I'm sure many of you have done, wait. Uh... When you do this with the capo on, it's still the same piece, but it's it's interesting because it, it, it just has a different kind of brilliance to it that, at least on my guitar, I, I struggle to get when I'm in D, right? Now, the other question is, the, the do we try to play the, the uh, tuning that Bach may have heard? 
if you like. It, it doesn't, it's not something that um, keeps me awake, if you like. Uh, and I find that sometimes when you tune down, some guitars tune lower, uh, some are okay, some don't. This guitar doesn't sound very good when I go lower. Actually, it's better if I'm just above 440. Uh, it just, there are some notes that just kind of start to ring better than when I'm lower. But on some guitars, it's perfectly okay. I would go more with how your guitar sounds. And I was going to put the example of a singer. I did some concerts with a singer a couple of years ago. Um, he, and he's, he's a kind of tenor, but as he got, he's quite an old man now, and his voice has got lower. And so he went, he's really a baritone, but he's singing some of these songs that are, you know, so he, everything he wanted it, um, three semitones lower, because he wants it where his voice is best. And, you know, you can't do that for the whole opera so that the baritone or the tenor can sound great, but you can do it for a recital. So I, and it doesn't, it's not something that particularly worries me. It's different when you talk about uh, if you're going to do the well-tempered clavier or something like that, because Bach is actually using the steps of keys. And Bach also often played with this whole idea of um, a, note ha a note has a, na a value, you know, a B flat's a B flat. It's not, you can't, you can't sort of move it in relation to something else, you know? So, I mean, you can, but um, he may have had some other ideas about what notes meant than most of us, you know. Oh, just, uh, Edwin, just to finish off with the capo thing, I also find that sometimes ornamenting a little higher, you know, when you put the capo down, the strings just feel different. And actually it's even easier um, on the left hand a little bit. You know, the, the pressure on the second fret is different from the first fret, noticeably different. So when you put a capo on, on one or two, the amount of pressure you need on these frets is less. Also, when you're doing cross the string trills, you're doing an awful lot of extension, you know, and you're trying to hold the chord down. So it, this is much easier here than it is here. You know, it makes a difference. Just two frets, well, big difference. So that's one more reason. David, I, I, I appreciate it. If you could just show people um, maybe closely, I think, uh, just I'll have an observation and then I'll follow with a question. Okay. Um, one of the reasons why his trills sound so ridiculously good um, is that <laughs> they do, they sound ridiculously good is because all of his fingers can get the same quality of sound. So his A finger, his I finger, his M, his P, he can really get a super even sound. And if you've been around him close, you can attest that it's one of the beauties of his playing. Could you just show us your concept of the, do you use this joint, this joint, how, uh, uh, it, with a free stroke, yeah. where, where do you originate the joint, the stroke? And then another question is, how long do, does your, do you consider your stroke to be? Is it way long at your hand? Is it a short little stroke, et cetera? Um, it's, uh... Very little before the string and more after, but not, I, I practice when I'm warming up, I practice taking it further than I, than I need so that, the, so that I can feel no resistance. But and then when I play, it doesn't do that, you know, so, uh, oh, that's an A. Let's see. So you can see right. but I, I, I try to keep it fairly flexible you know and, and, uh, I would say my fingers are uh, close to a circle you know if you put a small tennis ball or a small apple or something in there that's the shape that's my shape, you know, so all the knuckles are used a bit. And there are times when I, I go straighter, if I want it to sound kind of clicky and bright, you know, if I want that kind of sound, I'm pulling kind of upwards, you can see, and pulling straight and up. And I'm, uh, get a thumb out of the way. I'm also 
uh, tipping from here to here. So high there. That that like Breen, he used to play dead straight fingers. Rest in peace. Right? Whereas I play I play around there. But you know it, it's funny because you see someone else play and they use a completely different right hand technique. And if it sounds great, well, why not try it? You know, it may not fit your hand, but I think it's it's interesting to to watch. You ask somebody to pick up a glass of water, and some people hold it like that. Other people hold it like this. <laughs> you know, they they have their, their hands has a, have a kind of natural movement, or they pick up I don't know a pen. You know, and you'll find that most of the time my fingers bend a bit more from there and not so much from here, but a bit from there. And you look at other people, some people bend a lot from here and not so much from there. Or you see the people that play like this, where this is almost flat and all the turn is here. There are good players from all of those, but maybe advantages and disadvantages in each one, right? And I think in, in my, my way, there are some disadvantages in that when you go across the string quite a lot, um, takes quite a long time to actually pluck the note you know and the person that's going straighter from no pluck to pluck is, is very immediate and often the the super fast music actually sounds better um, where the notes sparkle out you know those ones don't sparkle out they, they are slower to grow right so we learn to use both and so I would say I, I use uh, this angle, right? So it goes, the, the angle that goes like that, but also this angle, right? So higher wrist, lower wrist. And learn to use them both. And for the trills, I actually, I actually use lower, higher wrist. So the higher wrist means that I, I can I flick the string, it needs much less, there's more resistance on the string, but the amount of time you spend on the string is very little, right? When you do this, there's very little resistance to the string as it slips across, but you're on the string for, I mean, we're talking about milliseconds, but you're on the string for longer. So it, it creates problems and solutions. I don't know if that's any other things, Tom. No, that's perfect. That, thank you, and you, you revealed a lot of great things. Well, we're, we're getting close to the end of this presentation here. Um, I want to bring up Julian Bream's name for a moment um, and say that um, congratulations, David, on recording the Jerry yes. Garcia piece. Yes, yes. Wow, you, you pulled that off pretty quickly. I know, D David. Yeah. Um, I just and, learned it right there and then and, and just when he sent me it, I just thought, I'm going to record this. And I got like the fancy lights out and I thought, I'm going to do it with uh, dark. That was, <laughs> that, was, that was really fabulous. And if you haven't seen it, I think it's on his Facebook page. Um, yeah, probably. I, I think maybe Maria put it on, on the uh, YouTube, on my YouTube. I'm not sure. I think she was going to. It's also on Dennis's, Dennis, Dennis Talks because I used his guitar. Right. And so Dennis put it on his Facebook or whatever. Well, I want to use that as a segue. Um, so our, our hope here is every Friday to have a, a Zoom conference like this. And I'll, I'll say that I'm very uh, honored uh, that David started this. And uh, we're more than happy to, uh, if you send me ideas, subjects, people who you would like to have here, um, we're gonna we're gonna keep it going. So virtually, keep celebrating the art form we all love. And um, there you go. So David, bravo! Thank you. Hey, thank you.